sorry if you had any issues. So my name is Joanna, I'm the admissions tutor for the dentistry course at the University of Birmingham and I'm just going to do a brief talk today um, and there'll be some time for questions at the end if any of you have got any queries. So I'm going to talk today about entrance requirements, I'm going to talk about how we choose who we want from our applicants that we get and then as I said there will be a chance for questions. All the photos in this talk are from um, our actual dental students at the actual dental school as well so have a little look at those because um, they'll give you a little bit of an insight um, into the kind of building that we have um, and what our students get up to. So this is a slide which um, I think illustrates quite nicely that we're looking for somebody who's got a lot of different attributes in order to be a good dentist. So some of the best dentists are quite artistic. There's obviously a lot of science involved. It's a healthcare profession, so you need to be very ethical. You need to enjoy interacting with people. So we're really looking for somebody who's got a really wide variety of skills and interests in order to be um, a successful dentist. So yes, we do ask for a lot of um, academic requirements to be fulfilled, but also we we are looking at other things in our applicants and we're going to talk you through how we look for those. So the most important question at your stage is whether or not dentistry is the right career for you as opposed to whether or not dentistry is the right course at university. So one of the things which puts dentistry in a little bit of a niche um, pocket is that it's a very vocational degree. So once you've done your dentistry degree, we are training you to be a dentist and you'll be at dental school for five years, but then you're going to be a dentist for a lot longer than that, hopefully. So the most important thing at your stage is to work out whether or not you think it's the right career for you. It can be a fantastic career, it can be really rewarding, it can be very enjoyable and it can be very fulfilling, but there are certain things that you need to make sure that you're aware of before you embark on a dentistry course. It's a highly demanding course. We expect our students to achieve a lot academically because we have to cram a lot into that five years and also you're going to be treating patients independently so there are stresses that come from that as well. You need to be good at working under pressure and you do need to be resilient. Um, and able to deal with stress academically and clinically. Um, so I don't want to sound negative about the course. It is really enjoyable, but you need to make sure that you're the right kind of person for the job and that you've made the right decision about your career um, choice before you apply for dentistry. So I've put this slide into both the talks that I'm doing today. Um, and we know that a lot of people want to be a dentist. We get an awful lot of applicants every year. We got last year, I think about 600, 650 applications. And we only have 70 or so places. The reason that we are so picky about who we can take is because we are so bound to that 70 number. So we have to whittle those 600 or down to 70. Um, and if you think about the funding for a dental student to be trained, it's about £300,000. So it's a very expensive course to get you guys from the point where you enter university to the point where you're qualified. And you need to have a chair supplied to you, you need to have nursing staff, you need to have all of your lectures, all of your teaching, you need to have your dental materials, you need to have your patients and all of the administrative stuff that comes with that as well. So that is the reason why we are so um, selective and why it can be so difficult to obtain a place. So again, these are some photos of our students working. So the dental course is very hands-on. Um, it's not a, a lecture-based course other than the first few terms. Um, it is very quickly, very practical, and you will get a chance to treat your patients by yourself. Um, and you will obviously be guided and supported through this, but the aim is that at the end of your five-year course, you are able to be a safe, independent practitioner, and you are somebody who can treat patients um, with a little bit of help with more complex things, but you can treat patients safely and independently, and you will be registered with the General Dental Council um, upon completion of your degree, as long as you tick some other boxes, which we'll talk a little bit about later. So we are really lucky to have a wonderful building, the dental school. Normally on an open day, we'd love to welcome you around and show you around the hospital and school. Um, but instead we'll have to make do with some photos. There is a video as well, which you should have been signposted to today. And that will really help you to get a feel for the building. Um, and it's been designed as a dental school and a dental hospital. So it's not like some dental schools where you have a hospital and you have tagged on little bits of um, lecture theatres here and there. This building has been designed to suit students and to suit patients. So we have um, student facilities within the building, we have lecture theatres, there's a library, 
um, there's a study area, we've got quiet common rooms, we've got a canteen, we've got everything that you should need um, as a student for your day at university, alongside our clinical wings where you've got all of your patient treatments that will go on, alongside research labs, we've got a phantom head suite in there as well, and all of the academics will have a base in the dental school as well, so we are all available, um, and we tend to have a very friendly atmosphere and a very sort of open doors policy to go and have a chat with people. So it's a really nice place to work and um, we are missing it a little bit not being there. So it'll be nice when we can get you back in there and welcome you properly. So the basic structure of the course is it's a five year course. So we don't have a reduced four year course for any graduate entrance. We only have a five year degree course. The four first terms are broadly speaking preclinical. That doesn't mean that you're not gonna have any clinical contact yourself. You will have opportunities where you will assist senior students, you will do simulation activities, you will do clinical things, but you won't have your own patients until you get a little bit further on in the course. Those four terms consist of biological sciences, integrational health, integrated sorry, health sciences, practical dental skills, things like that, really la um, laying your foundation of the scientific and basic knowledge that you need in order to then go on to your clinical part of your course. Then towards the end of the second year, you move on to doing um, a more practical work and you move on to doing a bit more clinical work. So you go on to do a little bit more um, stuff to do with treating patients, you'll practice things on each other, um, and you'll do a lot of work in our phantom head suite. So you'll really get your practical skills up to where they need to be before you see your patients. And then the latter part of the course, you're working independently to become a safe practitioner. So you're obviously guided through. We have excellent staff from a really wide range of backgrounds who are going to help you with your clinical treatments. Um, and you will really build your skills and your portfolio of work so that when you go out into practice, you're really well prepared for being a dentist. So can you see yourself here next? This is a little selection of some things that are going on at the dental school. So if you can see yourself fitting in there, then we'll tell you how you can get a place. So we know that these last few months have been a bit of a challenge for everybody, and particularly it's unsettling for those of you guys who are in education, because we know that you've faced a lot of disruption. Um, we're here to help with that however we can. There are an awful lot of supports of resources that are available online, and we tried to highlight some of those through our website for you. So Skills for Uni is a really good one, which you could have a look at, which is talking about the transition from school academic work or college academic work to university, because it's a very different style of learning. Um, and then the other things that we will do for this year, so if you're applying this year for 2021 entry, we've relaxed our need for work experience and volunteering because we know that a lot of you will have had challenges getting work experience. We've had lots of queries from people worried that they haven't been able to fulfill their work experience that they had planned. Things like volunteering have been a bit changed as well. So we'll talk about that in our talk, but also there is a statement on our website. So please don't be too worried if you don't have work experience um, this year. Our academic requirements are not something we're able to be flexible um, about. If you feel that you may be eligible for one of our outreach programmes, then there is a link there. And again, this is recorded, so you can look back at it at any time, or you can just search outreach BHAM and you'll be able to find our outreach pages there. So there are lots of schools and colleges um, who participate in those and you may be eligible for a reduced offer. If you're unsure, again, please ask the outreach team, they'll be able to give you some guidance about that. If you do not meet our academic criteria, I'm sorry, but your application will not be considered. All of the applications that come in go straight to our Central University Admissions Office and they will tick a box, say yes, they meet your requirements or no, they don't. And we only ever see the applicants that do meet our requirements. So I don't like saying it, but please don't put us down as a choice on your UCAS form if you don't meet our academic requirements. If you have any questions about that, please ask us before the UCAS deadline, um, because otherwise you will waste that space on your UCAS form and you won't be able to be considered. So, Academic entrance requirements. We look at GCSEs if you are applying with your predicted A-levels. So if you're a bit more of a mature student who's already done their A-levels or you will have already got your A-level results before you apply, these GCSE criteria are not as important. But for those of you who are applying to go straight from school or college to university, we need to see your GCSEs in chemistry and biology at grade eight or higher. So that's the equivalent of an old A-star and maths and English language or literature. So your maths has to be a grade seven or higher and your English language or literature have to be a grade seven or higher. If you do double science or core, intermediate and further science or any of those 
strange things that colleges and schools sometimes do now, we need to have the equivalent. So we need to have eight or higher um, or two A stars in two of those exams. If you, as I said, if you're applying once you've already done your A-levels, so you will have your A-level results at the time, we can be much more flexible on those GCSE grades. But if you are applying with predicted A-levels, you do need to have those GCSE grades. If you don't have those a if, they, if you don't have those GCSE grades, sorry, there is a little workaround, which I'll talk about in a moment. So A-levels, we need three A's. And they will be chemistry, biology, and one other subject of your choice. Um, so all of those need to be a grade A. The only caveat is that the third subject cannot be general studies or critical thinking. Um, it can be the Welsh Baccalaureate or it can be any other standalone subject. Um, there is no extra credit for a full subject and there's no extra credit for an EPQ or anything like that. So concentrate on your three subjects, chemistry, biology, and one other, and get your three A's. We are not able to take any resets, um, so that is GCSE or A-levels. So if you've reset any of your GCSEs at a later time to the rest of them, we're not able to take that as a resit. There is a bit of an exception to that, which is if you take one of your GCSEs early and then you decide to retake it alongside your other subjects in year 11, that's fine. So we can take your reset if it's taken at the same time as all your other subjects, but we cannot take a grade which has been taken at a separate time um, we need students to show us that they can achieve high academic grades under pressure and get everything done at the same time because we will be expecting our students to do quite a lot um, of academic work alongside clinical commitments and so on as well. We don't, re, uh, we don't consider students who retake a year, so your A-levels again must be taken concurrently, so they must all be taken at the same exam time over a maximum of two years. So we wouldn't take somebody who's repeated a year or somebody who does one of their A-levels later. Again, if you have any questions about any of that, please do ask us specifically because I know that lots of people have slight um, deviations from your normal path of doing um, GCSEs and A-levels. So if you have any questions, please do ask us about that. One other thing I would say actually, just before I move on to the UCAT, is that if you haven't got the GCSEs, that we are asking for, but you're confident that you can get the A-level grades that we're asking for, apply once you've taken your A-levels. So apply once you've done your A-levels, apply after year 13 on a gap year, and then we won't look at your GCSEs because you will have already achieved those three A's. So if you don't have that GCSE profile, then you can apply once you've achieved your A-levels, and we're not gonna look back at those GCSEs. Okay, so, I'm gonna move on to talk a little bit about the UCAT. Now, if I had a pound for every question, I got asked what I, every time I got quest, asked a question, sorry, about how we use the UCAT and how we have a cut off, I wouldn't have to go to work. I know it's a real source of stress for people. I know that people get very worried about it and they want to know what score they're aiming for. But the honest answer is we do not know what our cut off is gonna be for each year until we've looked at the grades um, that our applicants apply with, until we look at the marks that they get on UCAT. So we really cannot give you a cut off. It's not because we're being mean or we're being secretive. We just genuinely don't know how um, heavily we're going to have to weight the UCAT each year. This year is going to be challenging because normally we would request that people have work experience and volunteering alongside their academic requirements. However, this year we are not um, putting any weight on those. We're not disadvantaging anybody who hasn't managed to get that. So we may be having to rely on the UCAT a bit more. So my advice would be for this year, possibly our UCAT threshold may be higher. We really don't know until everybody has applied and we've seen um, everyone's grades and everyone's UCAT scores where we're going to have that cut off. We don't currently take the SJT banding into account, but again, that may change for next year um, because all of our admissions processes are going to have to be adapted um, to account for things which have been interrupted by COVID. The higher your UCAT score, the more chance of you getting an interview is probably the best way to phrase it and the take home message. So there are a lot of people who meet our academic requirements who unfortunately we can't interview because of their UCAT score. If you are a graduate, so if you've done a degree before, your A-levels need to be an absolute minimum of BBB. Um, you need to have taken them before your degree and they need to include chemistry and biology and you need to have a 2 one or higher in a BSc in a health related science. And again, if you have any questions about that, please do ask us. 
So taking a gap year, I think is generally a very positive thing. We have a very positive attitude towards it at dentistry and it's not something that we um, would disadvantage anybody for at all. The only thing I would say is please highlight that on your UCAS form if you want to take deferred entry because we cannot guarantee deferrals if you decide later in the cycle that you want to defer. Sometimes we may be able to offer you that, sometimes we won't be able to. So if you want to apply on your gap year, bear in mind you will need to be able to be interviewed. Um, requirements of the course may change, but they're unlikely to. Um, but this is a really good option if you don't have those GCSEs that we're looking for, but you are confident that you're going to get the A-level marks um, that we're asking for. So you will definitely benefit if you have managed to get any dental work experience because you guys might think you know what a dentist does, but actually sitting, shadowing a dentist for a few days will give you a really good insight into the career. Um, as I said before, we understand this is difficult. So if you haven't managed to get any work experience, you will not be disadvantaged, but please do tell us about any plans that you have for the future um, to do any work experience once dental services are up and running again in your personal statement. It's really important that we want all of our um, students to appreciate the job that they're letting themselves in for because the last thing that any of us at the school of dentistry want is for somebody partway through their degree or even after their degree to say, actually, this isn't the career that I thought it was going to be and I don't want to do it anymore um, because that's a real waste of your time. Um, it's a waste of your money and it's a real letdown for you if you get that far and then find that actually your plans have changed. So much better to decide before the course whether or not it's the career for you. You may also have done some volunteering. Um, we normally ask all our um, applicants to do some volunteering and if you've been able to at some point um, before everything got closed down, please do let us know. But also think about things that you can do at the moment to help people out. So yes, care homes probably are not accepting any visitors um, and we're aware of that. Charity shops are probably not trading um, or if they are, it's on a much reduced basis. We appreciate that, but we also value a lot of um, attributes such as resilience, such as adaptability, such as thinking outside the box. So if there is any volunteering that you think you could get involved with remotely, maybe working to help out with a food bank or looking after somebody vulnerable in your community remotely, making sure they're okay, delivering food to people who are having problems, supporting anybody with anything, then please tell us about that because you don't have to have a traditional care home and um, volunteering placement in order for us to give you some credit. So please do tell us if you have managed to do any volunteering. And we want to know that you're willing to help with the community, that you're interested in people, and that you've got a genuine interest um, in altruistically helping some of the people out. So as I've said, if you haven't done any volunteering yet, do have a think outside the box. Things don't always have to be hands-on and they don't all ha always have to be um, the traditional route. So if something that you had organised has fallen through, then do think about some other things that you can do. Now, interviews is another question that we get asked a lot about. Um, up until this year, our interviews have all been multiple mini interviews, face-to-face, -face, overtaken, um, undertaken, sorry, in the February half-term week. So when you guys have got a week of school or college, that's when we invite you to interview. This year, that may well be different. and um, We may go to an online interview so that we can be sure that if there is an extra lockdown or any further restrictions on travel, that we are fully prepared for that. But if we do go to an online system, that will be advertised on our website and it will be as close to an MMI as we can. So it's not going to be a panel interview online. It will be as much of a copy of our MMI as we can produce online for you. We look at stations um, which can test a certain number of attributes that you have. And very often we look at the way that you will approach a situation or will approach a question or the way that you will articulate your points um, as well as normally looking at communication and manual dexterity. So that's all going to be a little bit of a challenge to do online, but we're not expecting you to know a load of dental information. We're not expecting you to know all the GDC standards off by heart. We're not expecting you to give us a lecture about amalgam. What we are hoping for is for us to show you who you are, how you approach things, the kind of attitude towards stuff and the kind of abilities that you have. It should be an enjoyable experience. We're not looking to grill anybody. Um, we want basically to see whether or not we think you're a good fit for the dental course. And it's a two way thing. We want you guys to see whether or not Birmingham's the place that you want to come. So I know there are lots and lots of um, 
activities and talks going on today about Birmingham, about the university, and we're doing talks throughout the day about the specific dental course that we want for, that we run here as well. So normally during that interview, you'd have a chance to look around the hospital and look around the school. Um, but I'm sure if we have to do online interviews, we'll be able to get you guys to visit at some point as well. One other important thing to know about the interviews is that conditional offers will be made to the best performers at interview. That is to say, once you've been selected for interview, everybody's on a completely level playing field. So we're not giving anybody who's got A stars coming out of their ears any advantage over somebody who maybe has only just made the cut academically. It's a completely level playing field and we only base our offers on interview performance. There are certain non-academic requirements for dentistry, um, so it is an EPP course which stands for exposure prone procedures. So this means that you are going to be doing things to patients which may expose you or the patient to a sharps injury. Um, so you have to have certain health declarations in place, you have to have certain immunisations. So all of that information will be sent to you after you receive an offer from us. Um, but you need to, if you have any concerns about that, please raise them with us before we get to that stage, because if it gets to um, the time when we are looking to get your offer all finalised before you start with us in September, and we find that there's a problem with one of those health requirements, we may well not be able to do anything about it at that late stage. So please do let us know if you have any concerns about any of the health requirements. Or the DBS check, which is another thing. So you must have a clean criminal record um, in order to be a healthcare professional. So again, if you have any concerns about that, please let us know beforehand. Everything will be treated in confidence. But if you bring those up at the 11th hour, then very often there's not much we can do and we have to take your place away, unfortunately. So I sent this, um, this presentation a little while ago, but this has already changed. So when we were in March, we had a bare below the elbows policy for anybody um, doing any clinical um, treatment with patients. That may well change now. I think the best thing to say is you need to be flexible and you need to be willing to abide by whatever rules the um, Community Health Care Trust have in at the time regarding PPE, regarding being bare below the elbows, wearing head coverings, wearing disposable head coverings, wearing any kind of masks. So we need you guys to be flexible with what you're willing to do as far as PPE goes in order to um, comply with NHS policy. So that will hopefully get back to bare below the elbows, but there may be something a bit different in the meantime that we have to wear. So if anyone has any further questions, we've got some time now for some questions, I think, before we finish. Otherwise, if you head over to the student hub um, throughout the day, then we've got lots of questions um, and answers from, we've got staff and students available who can have a chat with you. So I will finish now and I'll stop sharing my screen and then we'll answer any questions that have come in. Thank you.